And I always think, you know, it would be such a cruel universe if we were born with a purpose that nobody ever tells us, that you've got to spend money, go to astrologers, travel to other countries, read ancient books in their language that you don't know, to try and get your sense of purpose. Yeah. That would be a bad joke. <laughs> Surely it, <laughs> it does makes feel much like a bad joke. It's crazy. <laughs> so it makes much better sense that everything in nature appears or is put there, whatever it is, for a reason. Otherwise, why else is it there? So every tree and every plant knows its purpose in the sense that it gets on with it. So we must be the same. Hello and welcome to the NixiePod podcast. I'm your host, Nicole Rene, a quantum coach and filmmaker sharing authentic spiritual adventures. We deep dive into life's mysteries and magic with amazing people that have followed their calling and have a wealth of knowledge to share. Each episode is an invitation to spark and nurture your soul. Rod Suskin is an astrologer, he's a Sangoma, he's an author, he has had radio shows and TV shows and so much more. Rod taught me astrology, he has a three-year astrology course, which I highly recommend. It's very entertaining. That was, <laughs> how long ago was that? I graduated 2004. Good Lord, I'm not even that old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah no, I've been teaching a long time. You have, and it's, it's been such an eye-opener for me to be able to learn a little bit more about myself. Mm. And we were talking earlier about how you can see what, from your karma, karmic mm. perspective, what to leave behind and what to work on. Exactly. I mean, astrology is such a powerful, we call it a tool nowadays. I think of it as a model of the human experience. You know, our, our myths, our histories, our psychologies, our spiritualities, our experiences, our ancestors thousands of years ago encoded that into stories they told about the sky. Mm. And the amazing thing is the sky hasn't changed. So it's like preserving it perfectly. So we can still look at the sky and see their stories and understand that our experience is the same. At the same time, so it starts on that level of great impersonal from the ancestors, from the distant stars, and gets more and more personal. So, and it really shows you that firstly, you are a microcosm of the macrocosm, and right. it lets you tune into that in the most personal ways. And then what it says it's doing is it reveals your karma to you. Karma is like this energy that, is, that literally shapes you like life force itself does. And so it, it's read to you so that you can see basically what you can change and what you can't change. Because why else would we need to know our karma? It isn't helpful to know because it can just depress you <laughs> if you need to, if the details of it. So astrology then assumes that you've had past lives. It does. You know, I think one of the ways it assumes it also fits the modern mind in the sense that astrology says time isn't what we think it is. Yeah. So the modern mind understands, even though we can't fully grasp, that time is not a fixed thing that, that like many philosophers and spiritual teachers tell us, there is no such thing as time. This is entire, everything is one moment. It's everything is in the same moment and time's an illusion. Right. And astrology is this mathematical system that can play with time, it stretches it and pulls it, and that's how we do prediction, by using methods to stretch it out mathematically to over there and I can see what's going to happen. So we in astrology have said since thousands of years ago, time and space are these things that you can manipulate up and down and get a whole bunch of information out of. Right, it's almost like a system using how the stars move. Exactly, because they are moving these reliable ways so they right. can become like hands of a clock. Yeah. There isn't really a beginning or an end, but they're going round and round. And so that we can then essentially read about the energy impact of these other lives, our past lives. We can't look at your past life and say, this is what you did and this is who you were. But what we can see is the, the energy of consciousness that is left behind, that is called karma. So like when we do something, like if I hurt someone, um, every action has an opposite reaction. So it generates an opposite reaction, but where? Unless they punch me back, where is it? Yeah. So what happens is it becomes a stored energy. Like when you wind up 
an old-fashioned clock or a children's toy that's got a spring in it. Mm. We wind up, we store the energy in the spring, walk away from it, and then as the spring unfolds, the toy will play. So karma is the same. As we do stuff, we wind up the spring and wind up the spring and wind up the spring. And then when we die, the spring's got nowhere to go. It can't mm. dissolve in space. The only solution is that we must be born again. <laughs> and so then the spring can unfold. Right. The spring's very complex. It's be doing lots of stuff, not yes. just one thing. Yes. So, I'll, so it's already there at birth, like our genes, and will unfold over the course of our lives. And astrologers essentially look at the spring and say, this is what its shape is, and this is where it's pushing. And this is, because of what you've done in the past, this is the residual energy. So how much free will do we have? Well, more than we sometimes think, but definitely not as much as we like to think. Yeah. So what the ancient astrologers, the Babylonians invented astrology, and um, about two and a half thousand years ago, started formalizing it into the form that we know. And what they said is that it is essentially a sliding scale. There are some things that are just not changeable. There's some things that are only changeable with difficulty. And there's some things that are easily changeable. Get on with it. Right. So actually, if you think about what I just said, most things are changeable. Just okay. some are difficult and some are easy. Yeah. But because we hate horrible stuff as people, we don't want to you know, get our nails dirty, <laughs> we perceive it like the difficult stuff is unchangeable as well. So it feels to us like there's two-thirds unchangeable and one-third changeable. Yeah. But in reality, it's the other way around. Only one-third is unchangeable. That's the stuff that cannot be changed. But when you say that, I want to be able to change it. Sure. Well, that's a good start. So, yeah. so then if you look at your astrological chart, the purpose of the chart is to help you see that sliding scale. The purpose of the astrologer is to try and say to you, look, some of the, this is you, learn to love yourself, learn to work with that, learn to work around that. Learn to accept yourself because there's a lot of power in acceptance and learning to work things around. Yeah. We know the famous story of the river who learns to go around the mountain who's, instead of trying to push through it, learns to go around the mountain. And in a million years' time, there'll no, be no mountain at all. It'll wear it away and there'll still be a river. Right. So we're the same. Some things by accepting or, you know, resigning ourselves to we actually mm. gain power from doing that mm. so it does help us see that and it helps us see this is where you ought to be making changes because it's going to be easier so it can inspire us but it gives us a much more direct line it's saying to you it's worth investing your energy to become more conscious about this you yes. do have the power to change it and similarly in the things that we cannot change if you understand what that is you understand how that works in your life it's very powerful. You can let it go and you concentrate can let it go. on the things yeah. that and, and you can. You, exactly. And that's incredibly liberating. Yeah. It puts all your energy in the right place mm. and helps us understand how we're part of something. Because one way of understanding why there are things that, there, that we cannot change is because we're part of something bigger than ourselves. We can call it nature, we can call it earth and the world, we can call it the universe, the cosmos and things we don't understand but unmistakably be part of something bigger than ourselves. Yeah. So astrology helps us see that quite literally by using the planets, but also then reminds us that, you know, some things you cannot change about you, we call it genetics, in the same way that the tree is always going to be like that. So we have a function in the greater world. We often don't know what it is. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You don't have to know what it is. You just got to get on with trying to do you, because yeah. you must assume that that's the function is to be you. So... So there must be things that we cannot change because we've got a function in a bigger ecology that we don't have power over and should not have power over. Mm. It's not up to us. Mm. It's like being a cell in a body. Every cell in a body must sit there thinking, what is the purpose of me? I'm mm. nothing. I've got these same bloody chromosomes as everyone else. And what is the purpose of life? Because it doesn't know the whole body. But every cell is important and every cell is relying on every other cell. They're critical. Right. And they've got roles to play that if they had too much free will, that the body wouldn't grow right. <laughs> so some things are going to work the way that they don't even know why it works that way. And some things you've got to decide. You've got to move that chemical over there. It's a cell. You've got to do your thing. I guess it, it reminds me of society as a whole. Like each of us are like a cell. And yeah. we each have our function. And yeah. that, that then creates the whole. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We have both individual purpose and bigger purpose. Yeah. And um, that, that also reminds me of the, the cycles of the, of the planets and how 
we're going more into a cycle of of wanting to be part of a whole, um, mm. as as opposed to all the individual work we've we have been doing around who am I. Yes, I mean that the individual work around who am I is important, but yeah. it can get a little bit kind of wrapped up in yourself as well, and make us lose sight of the fact that we're also part of something bigger. Yeah. So we do need to find a better balance, and it's certainly. I think we're learning the hard way, but okay, it's usually the best way to learn, that we, we are part of something bigger, and if we don't recognize that, we're going to lose everything. So mm -hmm. it starts literally at the ecology, things like climate change, understanding our relationship with the physical larger planet. Yeah. Nothing's any different, so spiritually it must be the same, it all works the same on every level. So if we understand that we, our consciousness is also part of a greater consciousness, not just things, physical things are part of something bigger. Um, and that helps us work more together and not just be me, me, who am I? Yeah. But it's a very good question is who, is, who are we? A question we never ask. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, it, it first comes to who am I and then it comes to, yeah. well, who am I in Exactly. Who are if, we? if I am this inner world, then that world must have something to do with it all. And there's other people. So are they like me? Are they the same? Do they have the same purpose as me? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if anyone has the same purpose as anyone else, exactly. No, I doubt it. Um, although we have similar purposes, but yeah. everyone counts because everything's there for a reason. Even if we just reduce it to nature. Nature doesn't do anything for nothing. Yeah. Because there's no wasted energy. Yeah. So we must therefore assume that everything and everyone has a purpose just like every tree actually does, even though there's millions of them. Because, because sometimes we can think, how is one person significant? Yeah. But uh, same story like the cells in the body, every one of them is. Yeah, and we are a part of nature, so we act like nature. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And we're born with our purpose. You know, people come to astrologers all the time, what is my purpose? Yeah. And what am I supposed to be doing? Yeah. And I always think, you know, it would be such a cruel universe if we were born with a purpose that nobody ever tells us, that you've got to spend money, go to astrologers, travel to other countries, read ancient books in their language which you don't know, to try and get your sense of purpose. Yeah. That would be a bad joke. <laughs> Surely it, <laughs> it does makes feel much like a bad better. Joke. It's crazy. <laughs> so it makes much better sense that everything in nature appears or is put there, whatever it is, for a reason. Otherwise, why else is it there? It must be like that because it's like that. So we must be the same. Yeah. So every tree and every plant knows its purpose in the sense that it gets on with it. A rose sits there being a rose yeah. and producing beautiful scents and fruit trees and that feed the animals and everyone's doing the stuff that they naturally are born to do. So we must be the same. So we don't need to ask anyone else our purpose. It's inside us already. It's evidence in things like from when we're born, what do we love doing? Yeah. What do we naturally do well? What are we naturally interested in? Those are the things that directly point to our purpose. We might still have to study them further and get a degree in them even. It depends. Yeah. We might have to develop it because we have to take ownership and grow our consciousness. Yes. But bottom line is you're born with it. And so astrology helps us see it mm. by identifying what's natural, what's easy, what's difficult, all of that. But ultimately, it's up to us to understand and look at ourselves. And so the purpose arises out of the question, who am I anyway? But yeah. once you realize it's not outside of you, it's like, okay, well, what am I waiting for? My purpose is actually in this room right now because I am. Yeah. So I don't have to go anywhere. It's like, look, maybe by the end of the afternoon I'll find it. So once you bring <laughs> things back to yourself, you realize, okay, I can get on with this. How did you get so much confidence around what your purpose is? I mean, you you started to study astrology and Kabbalah and, and were interested in, in medicines from a very early age. And how did you know that that was okay and it allowed to be part of you? Because when you started looking yeah. at it, it wasn't really so mainstream. I think I was lucky because it all came when I was a child. And you know, children don't really question things. Especially since I was the third of three children, so that you know, parents are no longer hovering, mm -hmm. so you've got a bit of space. And my parents allowed you to buy whatever you wanted with your pocket money. That's so good. if I asked for a book on astrology, I would definitely not have got it because they were quite scientific, my parents. But 
if I wanted to buy it, they had to let me buy it. So that's initially how I got a lot of that stuff. But I had experiences of dreams and things like that when I was a child. An angel came to visit me as well when, mm. when I was about eight or nine years old. I remember it was like yesterday because it was the most astonishing experience I'd ever had. So I knew things were real and that there was more to know. Actually, I was being taught tarot cards in my dreams. When I was oh, nine wow. years old, I started asking for tarot cards. And no one, including me, n knew where I got the name from. I didn't know where I got it from either, but I just started demanding them. And they said no, and I did the pocket money thing. Yeah. And, um, and astrology by the time I was 11, that I do know. And not where I got it from, but how I started reading about it, because then I started reading. But again, because of that childhood thing, you kind of assume stuff is true, there's a lot you don't question, and you, I, I learned to trust myself automatically because at that age there's no one else, especially with that. I mean, I did know I was a bit of a different child. You know, so I, I, by the time I was 10 or 11, I had a little hypnosis show at school. I was in like the fifth grade. <laughs> I used to, I got a hypno, a hypno coin, they were called, hypno disc, from the back of a comic, you could write away for it came all the way from America. Wow, that's and quite innovative. <laughs> it was the thing that just like dizzied your eyes and, and hypnotized the boys sitting next to me and called it a hypnosis show. And so I was already a little bit comfortable with exposing the weird stuff and obviously it didn't bother me. Yeah. Um, and I just felt, as I said, because it had been there since I was so little, I, it felt I knew it to be true. And then in my early teens, I discovered that plants could heal people. And I came from quite a medical family. And that just blew my mind. You mean you didn't need medicines? You didn't need the pharmacy? So it was very mind-blowing. Yeah. Um, so I began to realize you, th there's information that you don't get from the regular world. Why, didn't, why is everyone going to the pharmacy? Surely I'm not the first person to discover their plants are medicine. So once I had those thoughts, I began to realize, okay, you've got to um, realize that you've got to be the judge of a lot of the information. You can't just assume that you're being told everything. Right. And there's no conspiracy, no one's hiding it from me. It's just that there's what works, what makes money. You know, that's, so those are the things that drive the world. Yeah. What yeah. gives us power, what gives us money. Yeah. But there's all that other stuff that gives us consciousness and gives us healing that sometimes just falls by the wayside because it, it doesn't fit into the bigger model. It hasn't been marketed. Exactly. Yeah. And when you're a kid, you don't know those differences. Yeah. So I could take on all the alternative stuff as absolute reality. For me, that was the mainstream. Yeah. So that's what, in the end, gave me the confidence. Because by the time I was a young adult, those were my norms. Yeah. So I was lucky that way. And you knew just to, to follow your dreams and to I, follow Yeah, I really intuition. learned that you've got to trust yourself more than it is. For me, I would say it's one of the big lessons looking back over life. The most important thing I learned was to listen to myself. Mm. And listening to yourself arises out of trusting yourself. I trusted myself maybe also because no one else was into that or doing that. Or I, could, I was the only person I had to trust. But listening to yourself is when you learn that you are right. Because I think everyone has that voice inside them that tells them when they're right. And we have it all the time. Yeah. But we're so distracted and so being told by advertising and all those things, what's right and what's wrong, that we don't hear that voice, but it is all there. Everyone knows. It's like, you know, when you're trying to persuade yourself that that gorgeous guy who's interested in me is just the right thing, and the little voice in the back of your mind is saying, run as fast as you can. You know the run as fast as you can is always right. It always is. Damn it. <laughs> exactly. And it's very hard to listen to. Yeah. Desire, our wants pull us off in the one direction and our fears push us in the other direction. Yeah. So all of those make us not hear ourselves. But really, everyone watching this, and if you sit quietly with yourself for a minute, close your eyes, you know what is in any situation, what's right, what's wrong, what you want, what you don't, it's actually in there. Mm. So I learned to listen to myself because I was the only one at that point. And you quickly discover it's correct. Mm. Yeah. You know, your body knows what it wants. It's those kinds of things that and arise then, out of that. And then over time you see that, that it really works. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so you can learn to trust it. Exactly. So I, I guess mean, that's quite a journey for people to be able to do. It is. 
It is. And so, and so they must, because that's how you prove it to yourself. I mean, yeah. because I started a strategy so long, I could see that it was real. Right. And so in high school, I used to fake um, sell information. So I didn't actually get to the point where I could, I'd say to other kids, I can tell you things about Miss Sonsa, one of our teachers, or something like that. Yeah. Of course, I'd have to go and get her chart, where the hell would I get that? But I, I clearly was able to talk about astrology and be proud of it yeah. without worrying why people thought I was mad. And because they're the kids, they probably don't think I'm mad. They just think, oh, that's a that's what weird he does. hobby he's got. I mean, just, you know, whatever. Yeah. So that made it quite strong. But certainly, uh, by the time I reached the end of my teen years, I'd done enough actual charts to see this is definitely real. Yeah. So I knew that it was trustworthy. But it started as a child. I just assumed it was true. Wow. One of the books you wrote was around the cycles that the planets go through that mm. then show us cycles of our own lives from the moon and the sun with our daily lives and monthly lives all the way out to the outer planets to Pluto, which everyone's talking about at the moment. Yes. Can you talk into a little bit about the cycles and how the, the planets affect us personally and, and your take on Pluto? Well, I think they're a good demonstration of where we go from the microcosm of ourselves to the macrocosm that we're part of right. as these planets get further and further away from us. So when we look at those personal cycles, uh, the, sun, the sun and the moon are cycles that we acknowledge and we celebrate or use, make use of in our lives. Yeah. Both in the calendar, things like the fact that we do recognize that a woman's cycle is related to the moon. We celebrate our birthdays, which are the solar cycle. And then there are things, important ones like the Saturn return cycle, the cycle of Saturn, which are 29-ish years, comes around to grow us up, basically. Mm. It's always the big lesson of... Yeah. So, I mean, South Africa was 29 when apartheid was abandoned. Wow. The old South Africa. And the new South Africa is now 29. Ooh. And so, so we're maturing and we're growing up and we're going to drop a lot of the childish nonsense and get on with it. Oh my so God, that's promising. So nice. <laughs> <laughs> that is promising. It's always a very difficult year. And most people yeah. know 29, if you're older than 29, you look back at 29, and most people are going to think, I never want to be there again. It was really hard. Because it brings in those those boundaries exactly. that feel difficult to, to is about boundaries. stick into. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, life on Earth and adulthood and responsibility are about boundaries. But, you know, astrology says, the whole meaning of astrology is by understanding where the boundaries are, you have enormous freedom within, right. inside that. But if you don't know that the boundaries are there, you waste a lot of your energy beating up against them. And right. you actually end up having less freedom. You spend all your time banging your head on that wall, and you could have gone on the door on the other side. Yeah. That's the purpose of astrology. It says there is a wall over there. Don't go there. Don't try and say, I've got free will, I'll go through any wall I like. Well, just find the door, go outside and exercise your free will. <laughs> so, so that's how astrology shapes us with regards to those parameters. But Saturn comes along and says, now that you're older, there's something that you have no power over, be that your bond or the marriage contract you just signed, or the fact that divorce happens, sorry for you, stuff happens. Yeah. So all these things that really toughen us up. And we get to bigger and bigger cycles, which are even cycles of social change. So the outer planets, we used to understand social change. Mm -hmm. And social also means history and all the big forces. Um, from things like um, Pluto going into one of the signs at every 20 or 30 years, which is why everyone's talking about it now. But even just to quickly go back a couple of years to what Pluto was doing with mm -hmm. the whole COVID thing, yes. was a Pluto cycle. So in astrology, ever since Pluto was discovered in 1930, it's always been the ruler of viruses, interestingly enough, and hidden diseases and all of those things right. that are dangerous and cannot be seen. Nuclear energy being a prime example. It was discovered at the same time as we first split the atom using an atom called plutonium. Huh. So, so it's very much about this power that lies below the surface. And that is generally what looks like the power of destruction, but is really the power of change, which is generally has to be destructive, but it's the power of change. That's so looking at Pluto around COVID, how did you know that something So like Pluto that? and Saturn get together every 37-ish years or so. And they are like the two scariest planets in astrology, 
karma, things you're not in control of, power that you can't see, no. big change that you don't want because no one wants change. So Pluto and Saturn came together at the end of 2019 for the first time in 37 years. 37 years before that, in 1981 and a half, it was when the HIV virus was identified. Oh, wow. That was the previous epidemic. Um, so, a lot of astrologers throughout 2019 and before were saying something. I, I went, say, like a lot of them, saying World War III was just about to hit us. Mm. And in, um, I remember on my, my show on TV during the, the month ahead, in January of 2020, saying um, every country in the world is about to go into crisis. And things to myself, oh my word, I'm talking about World War Three, and I'm not using the words. Although the whole year before I kept on saying, don't forget, World War Three next yeah. year, and it turned out to be COVID. Yeah. But all astrologers could see that because Saturn and Pluto were coming together, which we know is ask, asking for big stuff. Something is going to happen. So it plants the seed of long-lasting change. Right. Here's a simple example. We take, say, HIV. Yes. So the AIDS crisis appears in the early 80s when Saturn and Pluto are together, and it's in a world that's a little bit different than ours. So, the fact that it emerges in the gay community makes it, well, it's their problem. That was the 80s. Mm -hmm. So, it was an underground epidemic. I mean, mm -hmm. millions upon millions of people died. Mm -hmm. But the governments weren't acknowledging it and medicine wasn't paying attention to. The result of that was that the LGBTQI community became more politically organized than ever. It went to the next level yeah. of organization yeah. and of, of, of seeking power. And 20 years later, gay marriage starts appearing in the world. That big distance of time is because they, they had politicized themselves differently from maturing to something that had an authentic political power and could get people to change their policies. A much larger group of people exactly. are accepting exactly. of gay marriage exactly. and relationships. So what's happened yeah. with the, the COVID period was, apart from the virus, which is the incidental part of it, right. is that the the social ch change that is planted at that time. Mm -hmm. By the time 10 or 20 years have gone by, we'll see, wow, we created something important, actually. Maybe it's because everyone was forced to do something differently. Stop yeah. driving to work every day. Yeah. Stop killing the environment and the planet. Stop relocating how energy and how we live. Where we don't have this, this crazy world of this nine to five in a suit, drive to two buildings using power and all of that. All that started breaking down. And that I don't want to be on my own in my own house all the time. Exactly. Yeah. So, and that's just one example of many things which started breaking down and will turn into new systems that are much better that emerge out of that. Right. So that's Pluto already so starting. slowly starts to change the mindset of people over time. Yeah. Even though there's a there's a point where you go whoa that like I see what needs to happen yeah and then it starts to infiltrate into exactly. the psyche of a larger population because it works like a seed or like an underground family network mm. now what's happening is Pluto is going into the sign of Aquarius yes so every time Pluto or probably one of the other big planets goes into a new sign that itself it's like let's call it a new kind of social era as opposed to a change because that's going to last for like 20 years yeah. Pluto goes into Aquarius so it, it produces societal changes around what in Aquarius is going to be concerned with if we briefly go back an example the previous one has been Capricorn before it got to Aquarius Pluto got to Capricorn in 2008 and the world stock exchanges all collapsed, bang literally as Pluto went into Capricorn Capricorn is about money and bank and old structures and all of those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And they were torn down since 2008. The banking systems for better and for worse. Some of it's, yay, we lost all those old fatty daddies in, this, in those banks. Some of it's um, more difficult. Crypto gets born. But some of it is also, there's more poverty and there's bigger wealth with the billionaires. You know, all the versions come out of how money will change. And, and when Pluto's in Capricorn. Yeah. And Aquarius, Aquarius is very much about society and the structure of society and what our goals and ideals are all about. So the, in the structure of society, you'll see two things. On the one hand, a lot of the old boundaries breaking down, yeah. so there's more acceptance, 
um, and there's more, a lot of the acceptance of diversity and so-called wokeness is really this recognition that we're all people, that we're all in this diverse way, mm. um, are equal in our representation. No matter what we no, think about things, exactly. each person has a different view. Exactly. But the other thing about um, it is it also then will create new structures at the same time. Right. So what you also get is this increasing fragmentation. While you get increasing lack of boundaries and societies all coming together, at the same time, you get more and more fragmentation because everyone's saying, my group has rights, my group has, my, 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 I'm this group. And so, so if it were 100% true that everything was so accepted, then the next step after diversity is everything must become one. Yeah. There shouldn't be LGBTQs over here, and it's fine, we must accept them in their group, yeah. and you know, people of a particular color or culture over there, and mm -hmm. we'll accept them, and eventually there should be no distinction and they're in the same group. Yeah. That's really where we should go. In an idea world, Pluto will take us there, but unfortunately, it does both. It creates fragments and creates society at the same time. Mm. But all of that, everything really, is an opportunity to grow consciousness. That's really why all this stuff is going on. Yeah. It's to try and say, okay, if all of this is true, what is happening? What's the truth? So we know that the great teachers in the East teach us that all of this is an illusion and it's our attachment to it that we've got to learn about. So just as an example, it's that kind of thing that we learn, that differences between us are false. If we learn to let go of that, then we've got it. Yeah. But maybe it takes forever to learn that. The other thing though that Aquarius is about, and I think that's much more kind of useful and usable even by us individually, Aquarius is about our bigger goals, our meaningful goals in life, not just mm. particular ambition, I want to be the head of that company, mm. but the bigger reason why do you want to be, that's the Aquarius side of the story. And I mean, there couldn't be a better time for human beings to please change their goals. This is a critical time the planet is falling down, we need a different way to look at where we go, yeah. why are we here and what are we doing. Yeah. And we stopped asking ourselves those questions, so in creating the kind of world that we created that's energy hungry. And, and destructive on the environment, if we kept on asking why are we doing what we're doing, why do we need to chop down a million trees and make this energy and so that we can run our cars and what's the bigger why and there isn't an answer because it's nonsense, we shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> yeah. So once we start having why do we do what we do and the only possible answers in Pluto Aquarius world has to include other people, has yeah. to include the group of the country because it's gone that way. Yeah. So on the one hand, the fragmentation, the one hand getting together, it's, it's functional, it's meant to do that. Yeah. But for us to not get caught up in a pull between the two is to realize, okay, so for me, myself, what are my bigger goals? Why do I do what I do? What can I improve about that? What's the equivalent of, my, of, of climate change that I've made in my own life, which we don't want? Where did I unconsciously start breaking things down? Because I'm not focusing on my proper goals. I'm getting selfish or wrapped up. Mm. And the goals can often, in going into Aquarius, be for the whole. In, I mean, they kind of should be so for that, the whole. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, so that's kind of where exactly. people will have the most flow, yes. is when they're thinking, what can I do that exactly. serves me and the whole? That's why, that's the solution to the problem, that on the one hand, Aquarius creates community and the other hand creates fragmentation. The only solution is to say, okay, let's look at bigger goals that we do all share. Yeah. Like, hey, we'd like a lovely planet. Yeah. Because there's no exceptions to who would want that. So those kind of things, but not only about the planet, it's about everything. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to figure out what it is, but Pluto says the power is in the group, not in the individual. Mm -hmm. That is Pluto's, in Aquarius's bottom line meaning. So mm -hmm. the power is in the group. But it's not my group versus your group. Yeah. It's the group is human beings. It's the planets that we live on. It's everything. The understanding that we spoke about earlier at the beginning of all this, that everything is one. And that's what Pluto and Aquarius will give us an opportunity to work on. Mm. Because everything is cyclical, we're speaking about cycles, it goes around again. And you think that, don't we ever learn? But it's not that we don't learn. It's that we're always working on things. So if all time is happening at once. 
Pluto and Aquarius is the corner of the room where we're working on fixing our goals. Right. Pluto and Capricorn is the corner of the room where we're learning about material values and actually getting them right. Mm. So we struggle to do that, but you get right and wrong along the way. And, mm. hopefully and again, the cycle, that whole cycle will come around again to work on your values and work exactly. on your structures, but from a, a, a higher perspective, hopefully, exactly. the next yeah, time. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. So that's why... We, why we repeatedly have the same lessons. You know, when people have some terrible experience that they've had before, and they say to me, but I learned that. I had such a terrible marriage the first time around. I learned that. And I always say, well, when you learn something, you don't put it behind you. It's not that I can learn that. I can now forget about it and move on. You learn it because you're going to be doing that your whole life long. It. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like when you don't get a master's degree, they teach you the stuff that you learnt in all the undergraduate degrees just at a whole new level. It's that same stuff all over again. Yeah. And then master. you use it, so you keep yeah. playing with it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you're a master of that thing because it's always about that thing. Mm -hmm. You become a master of marriage by having bad marriages. You don't have one bad marriage that teaches you a lesson and you only have good ones. <laughs> that wouldn't teach, well, it wouldn't do anything, it just wouldn't make any sense. Yeah. So it's the same story. You gradually master it the more we do it. And that's why we arrive back at the same doorstep of a lesson again. Mm. For people that are starting their spiritual journey, how do you find out what works for you? And especially when you're stressed and you don't know who am I, mm. and maybe you go to an astrologer, but when you're starting to go to try and trust your Mm. intuition when you go is this intuition or is it a want what is that thing that that helps you realize what where to go how what to follow so I think part of the answer to that is to say what aspects of spiritual life as a human being um, am I born with it doesn't come from a book or from a temple or from mm. someone's culture so the spiritual practices that we are born with, the ability to sit, meditate, breathing, very, very powerful spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. uh, something like yoga, using our body to realign energies, because we've got this body, you don't need any equipment to do yoga, you don't need any equipment to breathe, you don't need any equipment to sit and meditate, you don't need any equipment to chant. All these ancient spiritual techniques are things that we are born with. So we start there, because that can, because obviously we need to do that. Yeah. So if you start meditating every day, and, and maybe learning a breathing exercise, or, or, or a chant, because your inclination will also tell you what you like. Remember, as I said, if you listen to yourself, yourself knows that I like music, I don't know I like music. We know that stuff. Yeah. So see how you're drawn, is it breathing, is it chanting, but sitting quietly and learning to just sit quietly. Mm -hmm. So people say, I can't meditate. You know how many times I've heard that expression? Mm -hmm. Makes absolutely no sense. Mm -hmm. Meditation, everyone can meditate. By meditate, they think they're blissful or no thought or experiencing psychedelia or something. But no. So everyone can learn to meditate in one minute. It just takes a long time to get it right. Yes. And so it's the practice it's of It's the meditation. practice. And that's why you just got to do it every day. And if you do it every day, your mind will run away. And every time you realize your mind is running away, just bring yourself back to counting or whatever it is that you're holding at the middle. You then Count. become your own teacher. Exactly. Yeah. Because as I said, we're born with, you don't need an external teacher. Yeah. So that's where people can start. And as they start developing that self or that form of self awareness and that consciousness, then they can start listening to their intuition. And the intuition will say, oh, that's for me. When they hear about it, they see it. Or I know that's my path. Mm. Yeah, the answer will be fine with it. Mm. I love that answer, thank you. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to add before we finish up? Well, I think, you know, stop from that. I mean, obviously I'm going to say you must have your birth chart done, it's a great idea. <laughs> but that's also a way to understand yourself. And But what you said is what's so important, that the self is only started at the beginning because you can't get all about the self. So we'll remember that the self is a cell mm -hmm. that's at the center of everything. But for me, I think, the other thing I'd like to kind of remind us, emphasize, is because we're part of something bigger, we are part of something bigger, um, be it nature, be it consciousness, be it cosmos, whatever the case may be, understanding ourselves helps us understand our role in that. But we're living in a time, Pluto and Aquarius, 
where we're getting the opportunity to see that. So keep your eyes and ears open. Ask yourself questions. When stuff happens on the news, don't tell yourself that's happening to other people. Mm. It's happening to you because this is the Aquarius, Pluto in Aquarius age for the next 20 years. And so you've got to ask yourself, what goals can we have as humanity as well? Because I'm part of humanity. So I think this is all an opportunity for all of us to take stock of ourselves, to be truer to ourselves and to other human beings. Mm -hmm. It sounds idealistic, but there couldn't be a better time than Pluto and Aquarius. Yeah. So in that sense, I want to say this is a really, it's a great time for, in the nicest possible way, waking up. Absolutely, absolutely. And no matter where you are on the scale of waking up, there's always there's more no bad. Yeah. presence and work that you can do always, to have the, a happier life. Absolutely. Well. And sometimes the other thing is people fall off the wagon. I've been I meditated so well last year, now I haven't, and I feel guilty every day, and people think they get despairing. So I, the tradition tells us that karma, that when we work on our spiritual lives, we burn karma. Mm. Burning karma is like burning firewood. So if you stop doing it, it doesn't come back. It's burnt. It's okay, yeah. it's burnt, it's gone. So that. as soon as you carry on, you're going to carry on from where you were. Because yeah. that's why they call it burning karma. Yeah. When it's gone, it's gone. It's fine. Don't lose heart, just get back on the wagon, just get back to the meditation, just get back to the good habits of writing down your dreams, whatever it was, don't lose heart, just bear, gently, kindly bring yourself back. Rather thinking, rather than thinking, damn, I can't believe I stopped that journal again. When you finally get around to keeping it, you congratulate yourself instead and say, amazing. Even after six months of all I've managed to get myself back there. That is such great advice. Yeah. Because so we don't, all have it in us. Yeah. We don't need anything outside yeah. ourselves. So. Don't worry about what you did and yeah. stopped. Just exactly. When you're ready, get yourself yeah. back in. Because we all do that. We all stop. And as I said, it becomes so disheartening because you start thinking this is impossible. And how am I ever going to get to the point where I do this 365 days a year? There's no such thing again as that. Two days is better than one day if you yeah. managed. Yeah. With your meditation or your fixing your habits or creating your goals. Yeah, and again, from where, whatever aspect you're looking at it from. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rod. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you for your great. wisdom and for joining us. It's been today. lovely talking to you and everyone as well. Thank I'm you. Looking forward to the next time. Me too. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, please write a review and rate the Nixie Pod Show. It helps to get this information out to more of our soul tribe. Thank you for listening.